Um, first of all, I'd just like to acknowledge that um, the land that we're meeting on um, is the land of the Wurundjeri people, the Kulin Nation, um, and just extending my uh, respects to the elders past, present and emerging, um, and noting that sovereignty was never ceded as well. Um, so yeah, today um, we have the very great pleasure of um, introducing Associate Professor Simon Kelly. Um, so um, I'll let him, his slides do the talking about what his research is about, but um, he's uh, an Associate Professor at UC Dublin in the School of Electrical and Ele uh, Electronic Engineering. Um, and Simon did his bachelor's and PhD uh, in UC Dublin uh, and then moved to New York where he continued his career at um, some very well-regarded institutions, uh, including the Nathan S. Klein Institute for Psychiatric Research, Columbia University and City University of New York. Um, he then took the opportunity to move back to Ireland and rejoined UC Dublin uh, in 2015. So yeah, again, I won't harp on about, because um, I think in these slides, you'll get to see what Simon's research is all about. But uh, I will say that I think his work has really shaped how we investigate decision-making and had a huge impact, especially on how we do things like joint modeling of um, task performance and um, neuroimaging data. I know that it's become very vogue recently um, to you know just whack at a fusion model on something um, when you're unsure about a decision-making paradigm, but I can definitely say that um, Simon's work is sort of one of those cases where there's this really meaningful sort of joint um, linkage between sort of um, the models, the structure of the models and how the neuroimaging data comes out as well. So. Um, and that's had a huge impact on, uh, I can sort of count the faces on whose work has in, been influenced by it in this room. Um, so yeah, um, without any further ado, um, I'd like to sort of please join me in welcoming Simon. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh... So, so the, the, the distinction is that I don't just whack a diffusion model on it, I also whack EG on it, so it's even worse. <laughs> Um, so thanks a million for having me here. It's it's a great pleasure. Um, and just so you know from the get go, I, I just flew in yesterday morning. So um, it might be you know it might go a bit slower than than I expect, which is fine. And what I'll do is is just sort of embrace that slowness, and I might just skip over some parts of the the, the talk later on if that happens. So, okay. Um, so um, I'm going to talk to you about some of our work on sensory motor decisions, and. Um, that's when you get some sensory event like um, the sight or the sound of, of a, a ball coming towards you from somebody's foot. And um, you translate that into an action that um, is in accordance with your goals, which might be to actually stop a goal, um, which the Irish soccer team used to be able to do 35 years ago. Um, and so what we're asking is how do we adaptively translate sensations into action? And it's useful in studying these things to sort of use the classic breakdown um, of you know sensory encoding, decision formation, and action planning. It's a pretty crude breakdown, uh, but it's useful to sort of think about uh, things uh, in these stages or kind of ingredients. Um, and obviously, in the lab, we we contrive tasks that um, that are supposed to emulate these real real life decisions. Um, but I suppose the, the point is that what we find out by using these contrived paradigms, which you'll see, uh, translate to real life decisions as well. And in particular, you know, decisions that people might make um, in tests that we use for assessing brain function, like neuropsychological tests. Um, when it comes down to it, a lot of our behaviors and a lot of how we assess brain function involve translating sensations into action. So that's why these are important in and of, in and of themselves to study as a core element of cognition. Um, and uh, I suppose the middle stage here is one of the most enigmatic and it's where, um, over decades of work in mathematical psychology, um, there's been great benefit from the development of uh, mathematical models, like the diffusion model is shown here, uh, where the idea is that there's a representation in the brain of noisy sensory evidence. And um, in order to, to be able to make decisions more accurately, there's an integration over time or accumulation uh, shown in the middle here. And uh, once you accumulate uh, a criterion amount or what's called a decision bound, then that's regarded as enough um, under the circumstances and you execute an action. Um, and these models have really brought us very far. They, they, um, they can explain or quantitatively capture data on a vast array of different cognitive tasks. Um, they're, they're being used increasingly to explain different psychological phenomena, like how we make more mistakes when we rush. Um, they're also being used more in, in clinical investigations uh, and there's you know, a big emerging area of computational psychiatry where models like this and others are used to basically 
furnish you know more mechanistically meaningful interpretations of behavioral differences among uh, clinical groups and they're also being used a lot in uh, analyses of, of neural data right um, and usually the, the 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 most popular approach has been to take a model that comes off the shelf and to um, fit it to behavioral data and hopefully it's rich enough behavioral data that you get a good fit uh, using a model and the model might involve an array of, of parameters like this and you assess the validity of the model in terms of how well it quantitatively captures behavior and behavior could be summarized as a reaction time distribution and um, your you know your pattern of choices whether you're how, how often you're correct or incorrect and so on for different conditions um, and a typical approach then has been to to take those parameters that have been estimated by the model um, and you could for example correlate those parameters across subjects with brain activations in different areas just for example um, and then that would highlight areas of the brain that might maybe participate in setting those parameters or at the very least um, you can say that those areas are being influenced by those parameters across subjects um, and another approach to combining models with neurophysiology I suppose which you can apply when you have um, data that has better temporal resolution is where instead you you take kind of you know core dynamical properties that should be predicted of the decision variable which is what we call this thing that accumulates over time um, and especially those core properties that are in common across all the different model variants that there might be uh, and you basically look you know at activity in certain brain areas to see whether you see those same dynamics and the properties i'm talking about might be you know um, for an area like like middle temporal area for example in the case of a motion discrimination task you might see something like firing rate step up and, and maintain at a certain level but that level scales with how strong the motion is right and so that stands as a as a sensory evidence representation and then in other areas of the brain like they've seen in, in a famous line of work um, by Shadon and colleagues in area lateral interparietal area or LIP you see the build-up rate of activity scale with the strength of the evidence right and this is consistent with um with temporal integration of course because the, the stronger the evidence the more steeply the integral will build up um, and then another critical property is that when you, you know, no matter how long it takes the monkey or person to arrive at their decision if you time lock the neural activity to the moment where, where they decide and they make their action and um, you see a stereotype level of activity at that moment right so no matter how long it took you to get there or, or how weak or strong the evidence was um, to enable you to get there um, you reach this stereotyped level and that's consistent with the bound crossing part of the model um, and I suppose the, the difference with this approach um, is that you know it, uh, to some extent you can kind of you don't really need to assume the the any further dynamical properties of the process you can just look at them right and it means that that there's you know a few less assumptions that you have to make in the analysis of neural activity and the nice thing about that is that you have the chance then to um to look at the you know once you've sort of validated a, a decision variable as you know for the most part reflecting what you would expect of a, an accumulator then you can look at new situations and just see directly what that signal does and that tells you how to actually change your model maybe make a new one or refine existing models right and so in other words there's this sort of reciprocal connection where you can apply predictions from the model to identify a signal and use things you see in the signal to change the models right um and so what I'm going to talk about first is, is some of our initial work from more than 10 years ago um where we we tried to do something similar in humans basically what I just showed you was in monkeys um, and we use human EEG in particular, and uh, most of you probably know what that is, but just in case, um, it's, it's where we put a bunch of electrodes on somebody's head and we can measure potentials um, uh, from multiple electrodes at once from the scalp, non-invasively. And what it usually picks up, what it mostly picks up is the synchronous activity of, um, of pyramidal cells that are in alignment in cortex, right, which sort of behave roughly like an electrical dipole. A really typical and, and you know, very simple way that you analyze or, or that you um, use this technique to look at information processing in the brain is to present uh, sensory stimuli or, or in whatever modality uh, repeatedly and ask subjects to do something with it usually. Um, and for each repetition, you can cut out a section of EEG data around that. Uh, usually it looks absolutely disastrous because uh, EEG is, is incredibly noisy 
Uh, but the idea is if you repeat that enough times, like say 200 in this case, um, then a lot of the irrelevant noise is averaged out and you, and you resolve what you see in the black uh, trace there, which is a, a characteristic set of um, deflections up and down like that. Um, and if you have many electrodes, of course, you can plot topographies as well. All right, so that's the technique I'll use. And I'll, I'll, I'll go through that after, after I talk about that initial work, then I'm going to uh, say a little bit about more recent work where we used these decision signals that we've identified to try and um, inform uh, computational models of decision making, right? Um, so first of all, I should start by saying we're by no means the only people who use EEG to look at the dynamics of decision making. And um, many people, including people in this room, um, uh, Daniel and Stefan included, um, have used EEG to look at decision making. A, a common approach um, and a very fruitful approach over the years has been to use machine learning techniques and you know classification or basically regressions to take um, I suppose sensitivities that you would expect of a decision variable such that you know they should change depending on how strong the evidence is and to use that to extract components of activity in, in, in EEG that uh, correlate with these expectations of a decision variable um, and this has been really fruitful and this is not an exhaustive list um, but our goal was a little bit different at the start um, what we wanted to do was focus on on whether we could design a paradigm um, that was such that you know, these decision signals sort of naturally occur on the scalp, uh, unencumbered by overlapping signals of different kinds, right? So we didn't want to have to use these regressions and so on. We wanted to just be able to see the decision process once you just do a simple ensemble average, like I just showed in the event-related potential technique. Right? So that was what we were looking for. Um, and I did this, this work with Revan O'Connell and Paul Dockery, um, who were in Trinity, so our goal was to trace each information stage that you see here uh, in parallel and in isolation. And so we designed this paradigm. You can see at the top there, um, there's a, a sort of annular pattern. We had people look at that for about four minutes at a time. And every now and again, it would fade in contrast gradually and then, and then come back again. And every time that happened, the subject had to click a button, right? It was just a right, right hand button click. Um, we flickered that stimulus on and off. And what that does is generate something called a steady state visual evoke potential over visual cortex uh, at the same frequency of flicker. Um, and the reason we set it up like that is because um, the, um, the contrast of that flicker basically translates directly to the strength of the, st the, of the steady state evoke potential. And therefore, as you can see on the bottom there, um, and here I split up you know, the very wide reaction time distribution here because it's a very slow gradual change in contrast and we could split up those trials into whether they were fast medium or slow and what you can see is that um, the steady state visual potential as contrast is dropping its amplitude drops right and so this is our representation of not just a sensory signal or, or just a, a reaction to the stimulus but the sensory evidence the subject should be using to do the task right because the, the decision is about contrast right um, and then on the other end of the sensory motor hierarchy, we used a very well-established signature of motor preparation, um, which people had known about for years, which is beta band activity. It's about 15 to 30 hertz in EEG. And uh, typically if somebody's preparing a left hand or left foot movement, uh, you can see this, this decrease in amplitude of beta over right hemisphere and vice versa, right? Um, and what we saw there was, as expected, you know, the decrease that comes with the preparation of movement, and it was a very gradual one. And you can see that uh, in trials where they were faster, that motor preparation happened sooner, right? Um, but also, just like the monkey study I told uh, told you about, on the right hand side of that, um, you see the response aligned activity, right? Um, so that looks at you know, despite the fact that it can be very fast or very slow when they respond, we're looking for that moment when they did click and looking backwards like that. And you can see that beta band activity reaches this stereotyped level of activity. I hope people on Zoom can see my mouse as well um, around here, right? And, and again, this is um, diagnostic of a band crossing effect, right? Um, and which is very relevant. And then after that, right, the, the, the motor preparation and the sensory encoding were sort of cordoned off uh, in the EEG spectrum, right? What we could do then is just look, derive um, a broadband event-related potential just by averaging across trials. 
And what we saw was was basically just one thing. It's such a simple task, right? There's really you know hardly any demands to it. They were really easy. They you know, they they didn't miss any of these things, uh, these baiting targets. And what we saw was was pretty much just one thing, which is a central parietal positivity that that gradually rose over time, like this. And just like the beta signal, um, the timing of this buildup seemed to correlate very well with reaction time. And when you looked at the moment of response again, you saw this um, stereotype level which is diagnostic of a bound crossing effect. And the, the shape of this buildup is, is, you know, is well fit by a quadratic function, which is what you would expect for integrating over time um, evidence that is linearly changing like this, right? Um, so we, we have characterized the signal a lot more since then. For example, we, we took that same task and made alternative versions of it, for example, having people listen to a continuous sound and every now and again, the sound would decrease in volume and they have to click the button. Um, and we saw that in all these different cases, um, the dynamics were pretty much the same for the central parietal positivity. And that's where the word supramodal comes from, right? So I'm gonna to refer to it as CPP probably from now on, which just stands for central parietal positivity. Um, right, so it, it seems to, to do the same thing no matter what the sensory feature is or sensory modality. Um, and then on, on the, uh, it's also a very dynamic process. So where we had the same task, but sometimes the targets sort of were perturbed. They started to gradually fade, but then, you know, uh, increased again and then, and then faded again. And um, the, the decision signal buildup basically reflected that quirk in the, you know, so it's a dynamic signal that, that tracks cumulative evidence over, over time. It's not something that's just set off and then evolves itself, right? Um, the other thing is, in, in uh, under these same conditions, we had subjects not click the button, but instead just count silently the target, so there was no actual physical response, and we still saw the signal right under counting, um, and that's where motor independent comes on. So it's a supermodal, motor independent, dynamic evidence accumulator, um, and uh, another really critical property of a decision variable, of course, is that as you saw with the LIP activity, the stronger the evidence is. The, um, the more steeply the decision variable should rise over time. And to look at that, we used a task that involves motion discrimination, just like the monkey task I showed you. Uh, in this case, though, a critical, a critical thing that, that we, we had to do for our paradigm design goal was to avoid you know, uh, irrelevant evoke potentials that, that, that can obscure the decision process otherwise uh, by just avoiding sudden luminance transients. So that's why the contrast was a gradual change before. And in this case, we had motion and um, that was continuously present, but it was just incoherent most of the time. So the dots are just jumping around. And every now and again, every you know three to eight seconds, um, the dots would start moving coherently to the left or to the right, and the subject had to click the appropriate, uh, click a button with the, the corresponding hand. Um, and what we saw there was that our central parietal signal um, did what you would expect of, of the accumulator. So, a critical thing here is that from a from a very stimulus locked um you know post stimulus time uh, it basically rises over time roughly linearly uh, with a build up rate that scales really lawfully with the coherence of the motion and you know again despite it sometimes being fast sometimes slow uh, sometimes being difficult sometimes uh, easy uh, when you look at the moment when the the person responded and they were they were you know confident enough to click a button under these easy conditions, uh, you see the stereotype level there, and it, it peaks at the moment of response. Okay, so these are all uh, critical properties. And again, there's no sophisticated signal process, processing of any kind or any regressions, or it's, it's uh, just ensemble averaging of little epochs chopped out of EEG. Um, there's a low pass filter, that's it. Um, so my, um, my first PhD student, Natalie Steinemann, went on to ask, what, what do these signals do under um conditions of speed emphasis uh, versus accuracy emphasis and this is a very famous thing uh, in decision making we make more mistakes when we rush our decisions um in general bounded accumulation models give a very elegant explanation of this um just in you know when we when we emphasize speed basically um the explanation is that we lower our bound and of course that makes you faster in your response but it also comes at the cost of increased errors because you'll cross that lower bound more often by mistake Right, by noise alone. Um, and 
it's been known from several different lines of, of animal neurophysiology work that the implementation in the brain of that same thing um, is slightly different. The, it, it tends to be that the, the threshold level that to, to trigger a response in usually a sensory motor brain area is actually the same. It, it's not changed, but what, what's adjusted under speed emphasis is that the starting point is, is uh, it, uh, rises up, right? So it's elevated at the beginning, as you can see in this little graphic over here under speed emphasis. And so that's what we were looking for in our signals. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Natalie uh, made a, a two alternative force choice judgment, um, basically a comparison of the contrast of two interleaved gratings differently oriented. Um, again, she, she uh, mapped the uh, the two alternatives of the decision to the left and right hand. And what that means is that the motor preparation signal that I told you about, the beta activity, you can measure that simultaneously over the left and right hemisphere. And so you can kind of see two racing uh, buildup processes at the motor level. And um, you can see that the, the one that reaches its threshold soonest is, is the one that you know um, dictates the response choice, right? Um, and so what we saw there was, you know, without having to go into all the different waveforms that are here, in red are the speed emphasis ones, right? And in blue are the accuracy emphasis ones. And you can see this effect that I told you about that was seen in monkey neurophysiology. And um, there's a starting point shift, right? It, it, it starts at the outset of, of the decision process. It starts higher. Um, and then when you look at the moment of response over there again, um, there is no difference. And in fact, even if you even if you break this out by different reaction times, which is happening over on the right, um, it's it's you know at least you know statistically it's it's constant, right? There's no significant difference in the level that beta reaches at the time of response across reaction times, right? Um, the CPP though um, down here um, was different. Um, so in this task, we actually we cued whether they should emphasize speed or accuracy just before the evidence. So um, we baseline corrected relative to just before that. So we should be able to see some, you know, what happens when you tell the subject, okay, now emphasize speed and, and they should be able to sort of make adjustments during that second or so. Uh, but we saw no such adjustment at the, le the level of the CPP. Uh, and if you look at the, if you look at the moment of the response, um, there isn't the stereotype level at all. And in fact, if you track, you break it out by reaction time, just like I did with, with beta over there. Uh, there's this sort of rough inverted U-shaped function here. This is known as a conditional accuracy function. It's basically, or sorry, it's not a conditional accuracy function. It's a, a CPP amplitude as a function of reaction time. I'm going to show you the conditional accuracy function now. Um, and the thing to note here is that they're very similar, right? Um, all right, so CPP amplitude um, as a function of reaction time has this inverted use, so does accuracy, behavioral accuracy. And this makes some sense if the CPP is a pure evidence accumulator, should, because it should be the case that um, across different conditions and across different trials where you have you know, fluctuations that, that change your starting point randomly or systematically, um, sometimes you will be making responses based on more real evidence than other times. And when you make it based on more evidence, you should be more accurate, right? And um, so that this makes some sense, basically, from that point of view. And we took all of that together then uh, to to come up with this sort of architecture that, you know, uh, representing what, what we believe is happening with respect to these signals. We think that the CPP is reflecting a sort of pure um, signature of evidence accumulation. And as usual, whether it's the signal that 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 is the core computation that you know that you know that generates this or it's just reflecting it we don't know yet right but it's but it's reflecting it and we can take that to the bank and use it for modeling that's the point um and we think that um this is basically feeding the motor preparation signals and and it's it's at that level where the threshold is set right so the threshold isn't set directly on the cpp it's set at the level of motor preparation here and the reason that that this happens right the, the, on the last slide there's a decrease over time we think is because in addition to cumulative evidence feeding into the motor level, there's also this other influence that we, we call urgency. We, we didn't coin it. Um, the definition of this is that it's an evidence independent component of buildup that, that, that um, in some models it multiplies, but in most it adds cumulative evidence. Um, so that uh, basically it, as time wears on in the decision, uh, it takes less and less cumulative evidence to reach your bound, trigger a response. 
so that was our framework and then we went on to see if we could use that framework to um to to inform uh, computational models so we first looked at motion discrimination um we collected these data way back when, when I started my lab in New York, uh, but when we analyzed and tried to model the data, that's that's when very, very lucky for me, uh, Elaine Corbett came on board um, and was really instrumental in setting up the, um, developing the models for this. And she has since on since gone on to really build on the model I'm about to show you, um, which is just recently published in eLife if you're interested. Um, so in this old task that we used, it was a motion discrimination task, and it was again in discrete trials, meaning you know the subject had to make a forced choice decision on each um, one by one um, stimuli. And what we did was just put the dots on the screen incoherently. Again, we made sure to avoid sudden luminance transients. So the dots were up first, and then they changed color to give the subject a clue as to whether it was more likely going to be left or right motion. And then later, again, uh, coherence would start. And we, we asked subjects to do this under different regimes in different blocks. Sometimes it was easy, it was high coherence and a long deadline. Some, sometimes it was hard in that the coherence was lower. Other times it was hard in that the deadline was stricter, right? So they had a very small amount of time to, um, and, they, and this was, you know, really a ridiculous amount of, of speed pressure. And we, we just, it, for, the, for these purposes, we decided to sort of go extreme with the manipulation here. Okay. Um, which, you know, makes sense when you're initially characterizing signals for the first time. Um, so what I'm going to show you here, just to, you know, there's nine conditions, right? So, so I'm just going to narrow in on the easy and deadline regimes and just the neutral ones, just because um, they're all I need to make my point here, okay? Um, and that's that's published uh, in Nature Human Behavior if you want to look at, at the other conditions. Uh, so just looking at those two conditions, um, this is what the behavior looks like. These are reaction time distributions on the top. Um, red is deadline and, and, and black is easy. And I put in, in thin line, the errors here. So you can see there, there are pretty much no errors and it's easy as you'd expect. There's a lot more errors and the subject is a lot faster under the deadline condition. So it really worked. Obviously that they were really rushed to make those decisions. Um, and another way, another viewpoint of the same thing is to basically, you know, as you go along in reaction time, compute accuracy, uh, just like in Natalie's study. So it's called a conditional accuracy, accuracy function. And again, it, it's, you know, it has the beginnings of this, this same kind of inverted U shape here. Um, you can see that, um, you know, a, a very um, noticeable effect in this is that for, you know, subjects are making a lot of anticipatory responses and, you know, they're, they're after the evidence started. So, you know, technically they're not anticipatory, anticipatory except they totally are because there, there's no possible way they could have seen anything by then, right? You know, so they're making complete chance accuracy decisions there, right? Um, and this it, this is the kind of behavior, these, these kinds of um, features like this, as well as the reaction time distribution, which is very symmetric, you know, they're quite unusual and they're really, they're really forced on, you know, we force the subjects to do it by imposing the deadline. And so standard models like the diffusion model have a hard time fitting those particular details uh, because there's just no, you know, there's no feature of the model that's able to account for it unless you get into mixture models, right? If, if you don't have a, a parameter that's for, you know, the idea that on some on certain trials the subject just you know zones out and does something weird that's not really a decision unless you unless you get into that it, it's very hard for it to uh, to fit um, those particular details but it is able to of course fit the general you know the the important behavioral effects that happen you know that under speed pressure you're faster and you're less accurate right it's you know, um, it's able to to capture those aggr aggregate uh, effects. Right. And so, you know, that, that that particular aspect of, you know, whether it could fit well was a bit of a straw man thing. What was more interesting to us was, you know, once it once we were satisfied, it can capture the main major effects. We wanted to know what it said about what what parameter adjustments are made under speed pressure. And we wanted to compare those then to a neurally informed decision model. Right? So that's what we were about. Um, and we use the same framework. Evidence comes in. It's accumulated by the CPP. The result of that is fed on to um, a motor preparation process that's subject, subjected to a threshold and we get the addition of urgency. Now, the first thing we did was look at the motor preparation signals directly. Um, we looked at beta band activity in the same way that Natalie did. And what you see here is, so the solid is the contralateral to the button that was pressed, the dashed to the, the losing hand. Uh, so you can see, first of all, that you know whether it was the easy case or the deadline case. If you look at the moment of response, you, you, we still got that stereotype level that it seemed to reach. You know, despite very different response times, 
um, there was that threshold effect. And that's nice for anchoring a model because you know, were able to say that that is the motor, you know, that, that level of activity, we could just call that the motor threshold, right? And you can see here, of course, that under deadline conditions compared to easy, there's a huge shift in the starting point of the decision process. This is where evidence starts, right? So in anticipation, there's a lot that happens here. You know, you're almost at the threshold already. Um, and uh, another thing to notice here is that um, it's not just that the, you know, the starting point is elevated in some kind of static way. It looks like it's on the move already before the evidence comes in. So it's already sort of careening towards the threshold, you know, in advance. And we took this to be, I mean, there's an extrapolation here, but we took that to, to be a signature of, of that um, evidence independent dynamic urgency that I talked about before. And so we just sort of, you know, <laughs> it looks like it's on its way somewhere. It's a very sort of low temporal resolution measure of motor preparation. So there's a lot, you know, a lot of detail we don't really know, but the simplest thing for us to do, um, which we did was just assume that that just extends that that urgency component remains there and just extrapolates from from what we see here. Um, right. And, and it, what happens then is that after the evidence uh, happens, then, you know, added to that is cumulative evidence, right, that together uh, lead to a bound crossing eventually, right. And um, the other thing we can do, uh, because of everything I just said, is that, you know, there are certain elements of the motor preparation signal that that are, you know, I suppose, in a, in a relative sense, you know, we can be pretty confident, map pretty directly, and I keep using the word pretty here, right, um, to, to parameters of the of the um, diffusion model, right? Um, and of, of all the different features that you could think of, like build-up rate and all, all kinds of things, you know, starting points, we regard it as kind of the safest thing to do this with, um, where we basically fix those numbers in the model. So it's a really crude way of, of joint modeling here, where we basically said, you know, that number, this difference between the, the, the top and the bottom here, that is, that is where that decision variable under that, that, that condition always is on average, right? And, and this is where it is for easy, right? So those are the mean, you know, and we have variability around those, but those are the mean values. We just fixed it in the model. And what that means um, in principle, of course, and we haven't looked at this nearly systematically enough yet, um, but for these purposes, you know, in principle, if you fix some of those things, then you're able to sort of, you know, gain more degrees of freedom elsewhere, right? By, you know, you're still avoiding overfitting your model but you, you have license to, to explore a bit more complexity in other parts of the model because some of these core ones are fixed, right? Um, and so, you know, not surprisingly, it's able to fit the data well as well. It can capture the major speed accuracy effects, but it also, you know, captures these sort of unusual aspects of the distribution, like the fast errors and the, the you know, the, the lack of skew in the deadline condition. Um, and, and that's not surprising because we have an urgency signal that's there and that has some variability as well. So you can have these bound crossings that ha happen even without, um, you know, I suppose proper evidence, discriminatory evidence coming in, right? Uh, so that's not so surprising. More interesting is just the, the conclusions about parameter adjustments. Uh, and there are a few different ones, but just to narrow in on two, uh, two core parameters of any diffusion model are the non-decision time, which is basically, uh, you know, uh, all of the reaction time that's not taken up with the accumulation to bound process itself, right? So it could be motor process, uh, motor processing or sensory processing delays um, before or after the accumulation process so here and here. So they sum to make the non-decision time. The, the diffusion model, of course, you know, because of the weird behavioral data is, is forced to do this, you know, this thing where it's, you know, it, it, it forces it to have a, um, a much, smaller non-decision time to be able to try and capture this this really you know gross difference in reaction time so there's a huge effect predicted there what we're able to do in the neurally informed model because we have the urgency signal as well and because there are other neural indices of of things like motor time you know the, the time it takes at the at the back end after your decision is made to just get the button down um we can measure that directly at you know just before response and then we're able to measure separately uh, the time in the model, we can estimate the time we think the brain starts encoding real evidence uh, and separately measure the time we think people have started accumulating. Um, so we can separate those out. We still can't tell for sure whether we're exactly right in this, but but it's striking how you know the the um the adjustments that are predicted by the model are much, much slighter than the diffusion model. 
um, and then, you know, it's kind of an obvious thing, but more interesting is that the drift rate, which is, it's basically effectively the strength of the evidence, which dictates how steeply the decision variable rises over time. The diffusion model um, predicts a small reduction in that under speed pressure, right? And this is probably to capture some of the accuracy cost. Um, but the neurally informed model actually shows like quite a big increase in that drift rate. So there's an opposing prediction there. And, and with the neural data, we're able to, you, you might have noticed that I didn't mention the CPP in this yet. We sort of held that to the side um, to be able to use it for validation afterwards. Um, and if that's the case, if, if drift rate is increased as, according to our neurally informed model, then we should be able to take that other neural signal um, that reflects this, uh, accumulation uh, and use it, you know, take it off the shelf and use it for validation. And, and so we did see that, you know, the, um, just like the simulation of the model, um, there, is a, there, there is a steeper buildup of the CPP under the deadline condition. Um, right, and then I'm going to skip the next one because <laughs> we're, we're very close to time here. Uh, and I'm going to breeze through this one, um, which is interesting. And just because it's, it's kind of, it's new and we haven't even submitted it for publication yet. As it is work by John Egan, um, uh, who recently finished his PhD, he was looking at the effect where in multisensory detection situations, like when you're detecting a snake, if you can hear as well as see that snake, you react to it faster. It's called the redundant signal effect, right? And this has been looked at for decades, and the major debates have been about whether you know the architecture in the brain that that um, explains this effect is a race architecture or a coactivation ar architecture. And what these mean is. A race is where there are two separate processes that are that are each racing towards their own separate criterion, as shown over here on the right. And then whichever reaches their criterion first dictates the response. And so the the redundant signal effect, the, you know, the facilitation comes from statistical facilitation. Right? That when you take the minimum of two um, random variables, you know, you get this shortening effect. Coactivation is different in that um, the idea is that the whole decision process is, you know, the, 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 uh, the two modalities combine and are subjected to the one uh, criterion, right? And then the facilitation effect comes about there because under multisensory conditions, the, the thing driving the process is stronger, right? Um, and lots of work has been done on this, um, of the great behavioral work and neurophysiology work. And one thing that's been definitely ruled out is, is a special case of the independent race. Uh, and by that, I mean, you know, one where the each decision process for each modality, say auditory and visual, like the, in the snake example, they don't behave any differently um, under multisensory conditions where the other one is also present uh, than they do when they're on their own, right? And those can be ruled out because you know neural neural responses do this kind of thing, you know, where where they might not respond at all for unisensory, and then suddenly if you put the two together, they 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 respond like crazy. And um, so so you know, very clearly. Um, you can rule out the idea that there's no interactions between modalities in the brain. Um, but if you allow for context dependence, meaning that um, these decision processes do behave differently when they're accompanied by another channel happening too, right? Um, then it's wide open again. And we really don't know which of these architectures is the correct one. Added to that, um, what's shown on this last slide here, you know, I've just said, you know, this is from a paper here that just used the label decision. What's meant here is decision termination. I don't mean decision process. So, uh, and if you, if you, you know, put your finger on that process and call it accumulation, um, then you can see that, um, although it seems that race architectures must have two accumulators and coactivation just one, uh, of course, coactivation could have two ac accumulators because it would be the same thing at the output if you sum together two accumulator outputs as you would accumulate, you know, sum together first and then accumulate, right? Those are interchangeable because of linearity. Um, and so, so it's really wide open. There are two separate questions here. Um, is information in separate modalities integrated in separate processes, right? And if so, do they race against each other or is there coactivation, right? And uh, so John set up this task where it was like the, the, the same kind of continuous motion task. And he had these motion targets where, where the dots would become coherent and you had to click a button. Uh, there were two second targets, so quite long. Um, and at the same time, they heard this sound as well that sometimes it was a, a tone cloud that probably sounded awful. Um, and every now and again, it would become coherent. So there was a nice you know, uh, pitch that came out uh, dominantly. 
Uh, and we looked at this under two conditions, under redundant conditions, where basically respond for any of the three. Right? Um, we saw the usual thing, they were faster when, when both modalities were present. And this was faster than, than could be predicted by probability summation. So again, we can rule out the context independent race that's, that's not at the races, um, absolutely intended. And uh, the, other, the other condition we, we had subjects perform this task in was conjunctive, where they only click when both modalities are present. So they have to try to ignore when it was just vision or just uh, auditory targets. And that, of course, comes with slower reaction time. It takes longer to be sure that both are present simultaneously. Um, and the first question we asked was whether we could, um, we could explain all this by just a single accumulator. And you know, the reason we asked this, of course, is you know, if you think back to some of the initial characteristics of the CPP, we saw it just do the same thing, whether it was an auditory target or a visual target. So it's tempting to think that there is just one uh, CPP process in the brain. And there, there must be just some sort of machinery, you know, some upstream transformations that happen that whatever the situation you're in, what defines evidence, what you're deciding about, is just a transformation that takes sensory information and, and you know, translates it into evidence and sends that into the accumulator. And then of course, in, in the case of the redundant uh, condition, you would expect just a, a sort of a summation or something of, of different auditory. So auditory or visual input will be passed on to the accumulator. Uh, but the important thing here is that if there is a single accumulator that's subjected to a criterion, then across these three conditions, it should it should hit a stereotyped level at response. Um, and under conjunctive conditions, um, you'd expect that the upstream process is sort of a logical and operation where both have to be present simultaneously to translate into evidence that's fed into the CPP. And what you'd expect there is that under unisensory conditions, these are not targets anymore, it should just be flat at the CPP level. Um, and what we saw was that under redundant cases, the CPP did not reach uh, a stereotype level at all. In fact, the visual on its own, which is in red, was much greater in amplitude than the auditory, which is in blue here. And then the audiovisual was in between. Um, at the motor level, beta, that did show the stereotyped level at response there, right? And then over the conjunctive side, we saw that there was buildup in the unisensory conditions, you know, so it broke that, um, it was different than that prediction there. Um, and you know, the, the motor processing in this case, um, it, 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 it didn't appreciably rise in the unisensory conditions. Um, so some of these expectations of a single process were true of the motor level, but not at the CPP level. And so our interpretation was that there are two separate accumulators here, but they, um, they you know, there was only one response being made here. So they, they did eventually have to funnel into a single um, motor process that was thresholded. So that's what we know, right? Two accumulators, one motor process. Um, now the fact that the auditory signal is reaches a smaller amplitude, that could be, you know, you can represent it easily as just a bigger weight from the accumulator, from that auditory accumulator into the motor level. Um, we don't know exactly why this would be, but you know, one one plausible uh, way it could work out is say you've got two different neural populations. Some of them are auditory accumulators, and some of them are visual. And maybe it's the mean of each neural population that's that's passed on to the to the motor level. And if there are fewer auditory neurons, then they would have a, a lower voice on the scalp, right? Uh, so that's one potential explanation. We don't know exactly, but but what matters is that we can say that under unisensory conditions like this, um, the level that the CPP reaches is in the unisensory auditory condition, that's the level that's um, the level of you know in scalp units of the auditory accumulator that's necessary to cross the threshold at the motor level, right? You can say the same thing for the visual, right? And that's a, that's a higher level at the CPP level um, here, right? And then, um, and then what distinguishes a coactivation from a race architecture then is how these two are, are basically translated into the motor level. For coactivation, what must happen is that there's some summation. This can be a weighted summation. It doesn't have to be you know, just adding the two of them directly. Um, so that must be the architecture. And the, the race architecture is a bit trickier. You might, you might think initially that, you know, well, the race is just ruled out because the race is about two separate criteria. You've got just one response, right? So what, how does that even work, right? You've got just one motor preparation response. Um, but of course it can work. Um, you, you could, for example, assume that the thresholds are set directly on the CPP in this scenario. And when, when the threshold is crossed for either one of these accumulators, there's just a message sent up to the motor area to trigger the response then. 
Um, that doesn't really sit well with what we know about motor preparation dynamics. They don't tend to they don't tend to sit around waiting until the decision is completely com is is uh, completed. Um, there is continuous flow. So you, um, so instead, you could assume you know we're getting really into just abstract mathematical operations here, and you know setting aside how they they might be implemented in the brain. But another another option, of course, is that there are two accumulators that uh, feed into a maximum op operation uh, and that's subjected to a criterion at the motor level and that that would you know um, that's uh, equivalent computationally to the race model uh, because what matters is, is that under multi-sensory conditions here over in the race side here uh, what defines a race architecture is that when a response is triggered under multi-sensory conditions where you've got both visual and auditory information one of the two accumulators must have reached the level that it typically reaches in the unisensory case for that to have happened, right? Like this, uh, and that's that's the main distinction uh, where that doesn't have to, that doesn't have to happen in the coactivation because these basically work together; they add to each other in some respect to cause the motor threshold. And because of this difference, right? That's where you know having the cpp is some information i mean it's it's you know impoverished in some ways in that you know we can't right i've said that there are two separate accumulators we don't have access to the two separate accumulators we only have the sum of them on the scalp right they all just add together uh, but they will add to they can be expected to add together in different ways of course for a coactivation architecture than they would a uh, race architecture and one thing you can say is that no matter what no matter how they interact right the accumulators um, the CPP will should always reach some level because a response in bimodal conditions will always be triggered by by um, you know some amount of one of the accumulators and then the rest the other. Um, so the level that it reaches should lie in between the uni level the uni sensory levels, um, whereas it tends to be bigger for races. Uh, not always. Um, I need to speed up here. Um, so I'll say this really quick. We did some sort of vanilla versions of the. You know, what we went on to do then is test a whole bunch of models then to try to fit them simultaneously to uh, CPP data. So these are the CPP, you know, response lock CPPs and they're, the real data are shown in the, these sort of background faded lines um, and um, an RT, cumulative RT distributions, right? We fit them simultaneously, uh, all these different models. And we could consider lots of different ways that the accumulators could interact um, and we could we could really make it wide open what kind of context dependencies there are. It's something you can't really do with behavior alone because you don't have the constraints, um, especially in this case, because they're just reaction time distributions. You don't have errors, right? There's just detection. When they, there's no errors, it just misses. So, and there were no misses. Um, so very basic models of the coactivation and race didn't, didn't really fit at all. I'll, I'll, I'll breeze through it quickly. But um, if you allow for all those different context dependencies, uh, you can find a coactivation model that fits uh, really well, but you can also find a race model that fits really well as well. Um, it, you know, the BIC is, is higher, meaning it doesn't win, you know, the coactivation wins here, um, but it's still viable in terms of it's a good, you know, it's a good fit. It, it captures all the major qualitative effects. Um, but if you sort of drill into what it found as a model, in order for the race to be able to predict uh, the CPP and RT simultaneously, it had to assume that drift rates, so the, the, the speed of buildup, was greatly enhanced for the auditory accumulator when the visual was there as well. But at the same time, the visual was suppressed by the presence of the auditory. So it is, you know, it's quite an extreme case that happened here. Uh, whereas all that we needed to assume for the coactivation is, is basically a, a scale down of both accumulators when they're simultaneously present, which could happen in, in the case of just normalization. You know. um, when they're simultaneously present, they, they sort of you know, compete with one another um, and uh, what we did then, really quick, is do a, a, a follow-up experiment where we had lots of different stimulus onset asynchronies. The idea is that if the race is still the correct one, um, and maybe it's right in saying that what happens under bimodal conditions is that the auditory accumulator comes to vastly dominate over the visual one, we should be able to reverse that dominance by having some conditions where we present the visual one first, right? And wait a while before we present the auditory. We let the visual accumulator build up some steam and then the auditory can, can, um, can add on top. And that should just give more constraints for a model to be able to fit both. Uh, and what we did, we, so we saw, first of all, that um, 
across lots of different SOAs, the CPP reached levels that were in between the unimodal levels. And when we looked at response time and CPP um, amplitude as a function of SOA, uh, we saw that that um, basically the coactivation model, uh, which was fit just to the, to the simultaneous condition and then simulated for all the other conditions, uh, uh, failed to fit reaction times uh, in particular. Uh, the main reason being that you know it, it predicts this really sort of um, RT to increase in lockstep with SOA for a certain amount of time. Um, and so this was sort of, you know, this was the, the, the final bit to, to establish for sure that the coactivation architecture is a better is a better explanation. So in summary, um, we use some really simple uh, paradigms, which we think is a good thing to be able to just look at these these signals without having to make too many assumptions and just look at what they do and use them as constraints for models. And um, obviously, there's there's lots of challenges, though. Right. One is that, you know, these are grand average fits so far. Right. And one thing we're trying to work on now is hierarchical modeling, um, which you know has been done a lot with behavior alone, but it's really tricky with EEG because you've got people who, don't, you know, I mentioned beta signals a lot. Some people just have none, you know. <laughs> so um, what do you do with those? And and of course that that's also the reason we need to do hierarchical modeling so that you know the group can kind of, um, you know, gloss over that, you know, or, or sort of uh, give a leg up to those subjects and hopefully be able to estimate uh, individual differences there. The other thing is, you know. These are nice reduced paradigms, but they, you know they're super boring. And you know the more interesting things that we would like to actually study, you know, realistic decision making scenarios, um, you know, will be trickier to be able to do what I uh, I just explained. And then finally, you know, how these signals are generated um, still remains quite poorly understood. Uh, so there's a lot to do there. And I'd like to acknowledge um, all the people in my lab in Boulder, the people who um, who contributed directly to what I showed, but. Of course, you know, all my collaborators and, and mentors over the years have shaped my thinking over the years. So I'll, I'll get to mention and, and uh, I'd like to thank my funding sources and to say thank you again. Thank you. Hi, great talk. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, one relates to, to your the multisensory, uh, the audiovisual integration um, experiment. I couldn't help but think where in the brain uh, the integration is taking place. And one possibility would be the motor cortex, as I understood you might be uh, hinting at. But other possibility would be, uh, you know, other multisensory areas in the brain, which we know uh, do integration. So just wondering whether the data you have is suitable for doing some source reconstruction uh, analysis to look at where in the brain or whether you're planning to um, mm. go into MRI or... Yeah, so, so you're, you're particularly asking about multisensory integration as opposed to temporal integration, where that happens, right? Where, the, where, they, where they come together. Um, I mean, in general, you know, there's a question of where 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 is the CPP generated in the brain, and and um, it's one that we're we're chasing after using imaging. I mean, you can use these data for source analysis. Once you have a topography, you can do source analysis, right? It's just that, you know, I, I never I never really see the point of doing it unless you can validate it. So how do you check whether it's correct? You know, there's a lot of sort of, you know, you just have to be a believer in those algorithms. Um, if you use different algorithms, do you get different answers? Which one do you believe, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and so we're, we're trying to use imaging to do it. And um, we're actually using the same kind of logic that we had in the original um, paradigm where we just tried to make it so simple. Um, it's just uh, targets that sometimes come up in continuously present stimuli. And we're able to just, you know, use the, you know, where, where the targets happened. And we have people do auditory versions and visual versions upward contrast changes, downward contrast changes, right? So all of these things would be different for sensory areas, which would otherwise correlate with the same thing. Because one of the big issues with trying to identify decision variables by what you expect their sensitivities to be to things like evidence strength um, is that it's not unique, right? Um, so a common thing is to say anything that predicts choice, you know, that's, that's going to be a candidate decision variable, right? Um, but number one, um, sensory activity predicts choice, right? There's you know a, a very uh, well-known phenomenon is choice probability in sensory cortex. So those areas active, activate too. And how do you know they're integrating versus just representing the evidence? Mm -hmm. And number two, uh, some signals, the CPP included, does not actually discriminate choice, right? It rises positively, whether you're, you're responding leftward motion or rightward motion, right? 
Um, and I think this makes sense if there are, you know, if there's a, a population of neurons that, um, you know, just like auditory and visual accumulators I talked about there, if there are intermingled populations that, I mean, they don't have to be intermingled, but they probably are given what we know about mixed selectivity in parietal and frontal areas, um, you know, they would, um, you know, whether or not the, the cumulative evidence favors one alternative or the other, you would expect that on aggregate, as we look at this from the scalp, that it would look the same, right? And so we shouldn't expect that there should be very strong choice predictiveness uh, for discriminations on the scalp. Um, so so I, I think it's important to, you know, to go back to basics and use these simple paradigms to do, so, so it's in process and uh, we have some candidate areas, you know, the insula is going, you know, is going crazy, of course, like it does. Um, but uh, we, we are getting activations in intraparietal sulcus as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, just a, a comment. I think with regards to EEG reconstruction, it depends on how many channels you have. And it's been shown that if you have 64 and, and above, and, and if you have a, a way of um, measuring uh, the fiducial points, you can have really good uh, yeah. algorithms. Um, particularly with uh, distributed source uh, algorithms, you can yeah. have pretty reliable reconstruction yeah. signal. Well, we, yeah, but, I mean, yeah, 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 to, yeah to, to, to be clear, we, we are definitely going to do that. Yeah. But when we also have the fMRI. So yes, can, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that definitely, yeah. having the two modalities would have a lot more yeah, confidence. Yeah, hopefully they um, And my other quick question is, um, I missed, when you talked about urgency in your I think, third experiment, um, it wasn't clear to me whether you modeled that as a parameter or um, whether that's effectively like lowering the the decision bound. Yeah, so it is the same thing as as a collapsing bound, and you know, we assumed a linear collapse rate basically just because it's parsimonious, um, and uh, that was it. The the you know the angle at which you know, the the build up rate of the urgency signal that was a free parameter actually, and so was variability in that, right? and there was a separate one for each regime as well, right? So there's a bit of flexibility in there. Great, thanks. So we're running up on 12 now. So we've got one question from Dan and then my call there, if that's all right. Whether you had ever looked at Jim Townsend's workload capacity coefficients for either the response times or the um, EEG data to get some sort of non-parametric convergence to your model fitting results in, in the multi-sensory integration experiments? Uh, in the multi-sensory, uh, I haven't uh, is a short answer. Um, but can you elaborate on why in the multi-sensory task in particular it's important to do? Uh, the, the, the workload capacity coefficient is designed particularly to compare a, a, a dual task versus single task uh, response times and give you um, kind of an estimate which um, allows you to compare to the independent or what you're calling the uh, context independent parallel model uh, as a baseline. And um, so the, the uh, race model inequality can be plotted in that space as an upper boundary on independent parallel processing. Um, but it would be really interesting to see, and, and it's non-parametric, so you don't have to actually fit the models to apply the, the test. You just need the, um, the data. So it'd be interesting to, to look at it across the CPP and beta estimates as well to see whether the, you're getting consistent capacity estimates across all of the measures. Ah, yeah. So it would be an independent test to see see if we see the same the same things coming out as the modeler are, are estimating, such as the the sort of scaling down of the processes under under coactivation, right? Yeah, uh, that sounds great. I'm going to look into that. Thanks. It, it will behave like normalization, so it right. provides an alternative cognitive based capacity way of will behave under some circumstances identically to normalization, which you want to do as a sort of neural interpretation yeah, and yeah. scaling down. Okay. Okay. We're gonna get one, so I'll I'll probably okay. hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> well, thanks everyone for planning. Thanks, Simon. Thanks a lot.